the Peterson Institute is one of the best fora for all we hope to do in trade and for the international economy and for global prosperity. I can't begin to tell you how much I admire the people here or how much I appreciate the programs here. I told uh, Fred as I came in that I always learn something when I come here and listen to someone else speak. I'm not sure how much I'll learn today from listening to myself speak, but perhaps I can add a word or two to all that's already been said. Uh, it, it's true, I confess. Uh, I uh, have a checkered past. Uh, I am a, a former member of Congress, and perhaps worse, on a global basis, I was one of those uh, faceless foreign judges in Geneva. Uh, as one of the founding seven members of the appellate body of the WTO. So I can usually make what might be described as an educated guess about the outcome of a potential WTO dispute. There are at this point probably 50,000 pages of rulings in WTO dispute settlement, and I confess uh, I wrote a number of them. Most people in this city are losing sleep at night worrying about the outcome of the 2012 election. I'm not. I am at this point post-partisan and increasingly post-political. <laughs> I was telling my friend Rick Sammons here that uh, I very much appreciate uh, the fact that the World Economic Forum a year or so ago anointed me as one of its thought leaders. There are very few former members of Congress who are described as thought leaders anywhere in the world, and least of all in Washington. Instead, I stay up at night worrying about other things that uh, concern us not only in 2012, but in all the years beyond. Foremost on my list are climate change and trade. They both keep me awake at night. When I was in the Congress, I had the privilege of serving on the Science Committee. Uh, I was there in the early 90s and heard the testimony of James Hansen and others about climate change and about all we are do doing as a species to cause climate change. You may doubt this, but I don't. I see climate change as overwhelmingly, overridingly, the preeminent issue of our time, and I think that Americans and others everywhere need to do much more about it than yesterday. I should perhaps add that in the 2000 election campaign, I was the vice chairman for Al Gore in Florida. I generally share his views, and especially on the issue of climate change. But what are we doing on climate? Far too little. Far too little. And on trade, I went to the WTO for two reasons. First, I believe that trade can increase the potential for the full exercise of human freedom. It creates opportunities for more enjoyment of freedom every day. By lowering barriers to trade, we can increase opportunities for human prosperity and for all it implies. I also believe that by proving there could be such a thing as the international rule of law in trade, we could perhaps prove that there could also be the international rule of law in other shared areas of human concern. That's why I spent a decade in Geneva, and that's why I continue to work for uh, lowering barriers to trade worldwide today 
even in my post-partisan, post-political era. But what are we doing on trade? I'm pleased that at long last the Congress has concluded the free trade agreements with Colombia, Panama, and Korea. But if you read the report of the U.S. International Trade Commission on those agreements and on the effect they will have on our economy, uh, I believe they concluded that together they would add about one-tenth of one percent to our GDP over the next decade. I would have voted for all three of them. But to me, one of the challenges we face as a nation and as a world is returning our emphasis to multilateral efforts to lower barriers to trade on a global basis. And I believe we must do so by strengthening and sustaining and using the WTO-based trading system. Are we doing that? Not really. Uh, dispute settlement is working. I'm all in favor of that, but we don't have much more to the WTO now than dispute settlement. That's dangerous for the existence of the system and its continued success. It might surprise you that as a former judge in the WTO, I would suggest that we need to decide fewer WTO-related issues in dispute settlement, but that's exactly how I feel. I think we're always better off negotiating an agreement instead of litigating a settlement. And as it is, we're an impasse over trade on a global basis because we have been unable to find any way to move forward beyond the single undertaking and the consensus principle that constrains us. And instead, we've had a proliferation of free trade agreements, all of which I support. But altogether, they are increasingly having the consequence of undermining the most favored nation principle that is at the very heart of the global trading system. On a bipartisan basis, this country has for decades given priority to negotiating lower barriers to trade on a global basis. We need to do so again. The World Economic Forum asked uh, me a year ago to chair a task force on trade and climate change in my new capacity as thought leader. And we produced a report that uh, was presented at Cancun. Uh, I encourage you to go on uh, the web website and, and read it. Gary and others were helpful to us in uh, trying to uh, reduce our thoughts to writing there. Ricardo Melendez Ortiz uh, is here, my friend, others around the world. It's a worthwhile report uh, in which we tried to uh, alert everyone to the danger that we could not continue to consider the issues of trade and climate change separately. We need to do what we can to think of them together so that we can avoid a collision between our efforts to lower barriers to trade and our efforts to combat climate change. One recommendation we had in our report was that we find more ways to use WTO rules affirmatively to combat climate change. All too often, and usually mistakenly, and deceivingly, and deceptively, it is said that this WTO is somehow counter to the environment. Uh, all evidence is to the contrary. In its first 15 years, the WTO has been very eco-friendly in its judgments and in its rules. But there is so much more that could be done with WTO rules than we are doing now 
that would advance the cause of combating climate change. In my very strong view, trade can be green and WTO rules can be used as tools to make it so. There is much that we need on the trade agenda that uh, is locked in the impasse of the Doha development round. One thing we desperately need is to lower tariffs and other trade barriers to environmental goods and services. This is on the agenda of the Doha round. But we're not able to conclude any agreement on environmental goods and services because we can't conclude the Doha round. We can't conclude the Doha round because we don't have a consensus among all WTO members on concluding the round. That's where we stand. There is another report that has been advanced and submitted by the World Economic Forum, in this case by our Global Agenda Council on Trade, in which Gary and I and Ricardo and uh, Robert Lawrence and others serve. We have suggested that the WTO look for another way forward that would take us beyond the single undertaking. We have suggested what we call a club of clubs approach. This would be an approach in which coalitions of the willing among WTO members would come together to conclude WTO plus agreements in areas of shared concern by which they would be bound. These agreements would then be open going forward for other WTO members to join, but they would not be required to do so. These agreements could relate to various sectors of trade. They could relate to various issues relating to trade. They could relate to some of the newer issues that affect trade but are not yet fully covered by WTO rules. As those of you who've been uh, doing trade for a while know, this is not a new idea. Back when uh, Fred and Gary and I were a little younger, when Amy Porges and I were at USTR, uh, she was 12 and I was 13, uh, we were busy implementing the codes of the Tokyo round. These codes were essentially what we're talking about. They were coalitions of the willing in some areas of shared concern that went beyond the traditional areas covered by the GATT, but were not yet to the point where they're could be a consensus among all the members, the contracting parties at the time, to make them fully binding on everyone. They included standards, subsidies, and others. And of course, these codes over time evolved in the later Uruguay round uh, to become fully multilateral agreements that are now part of what altogether comprised the WTO treaty. So this is not a new idea we've offered. It's simply the recycling of an old idea for new circumstances. And there are several examples uh, before us now that are ripe, as I see it, for the club of clubs approach. For example, there is the anarch counterfeiting trade agreement, which is TRIPS plus for those of you who follow intellectual property issues in trade. Why not make that such an agreement? There is the proposed Trans-Pacific Partnership. I'm all in favor of it. But why reinvent the trade wheel? Why not do that within and under the auspices of the WTO? All the countries involved are WTO members. This can be done, just to be a lawyer on you for a moment, uh, as uh, a plurilateral agreement under Annex 4 of the WTO Treaty. 
These plurilateral agreements are permissible under Article 2, Paragraph 3 of the WTO agreement and are governed by Article 10, Paragraph 9. By consensus, members of the WTO can agree to add plurilateral agreements that would bind some but not all WTO members. And the advantage of such agreements is that they can be expanded over time to include all WTO members and in the meantime they can be fully enforceable by being enforced through the rules of WTO dispute settlement because they would be binding a dispute settlement on those who chose to be parties to those agreements. As I said, ACTA and the TPP are good examples of what we might do, but by far the best example to me of an opportunity to have a club that can move the trading system forward in the right way is the proposal for a sustainable energy trade agreement. This could be a coalition of, willing, of the willing that could advance the cause of climate change as well as the cause of lowering barriers to trade. You all know the numbers better than I do. Energy use and supply uh, account for 75 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. Uh, developing countries are one-third as energy efficient as OECD countries. Certainly we need to be more efficient ourselves, but beyond that we need to find better ways to speed the spread of new green clean technologies worldwide to the developing world. There are a number of issues we could address within a sustainable energy trade agreement. First of all, we could reduce over time and gradually eliminate all tariffs and taxes on sustainable energy. Here I agree with my friend Gary Huffbauer that this is where we, we should start. This is where we usually start on trade and the reason is this is a price that's added at the border. It's a tax that distorts trade and keeps consumers from being able to profit from these new technologies. Second, we need to harmonize standards. We have conflicting standards everywhere in the world, taking the form sometimes of full-blown technical regulations. Sometimes these are justified. Sometimes these are merely protectionist. Better to try to harmonize standards than to end up in WTO dispute settlement endlessly over uh, disputes about whether these regulations are justified or not. Those who are following dispute settlement now know that we're finally getting to the point 15 years on where there are a number of cases making their way through the system trying to define what a technical regulation is and where it's justified for a country to apply a regulation. Better that we negotiate answers here. As Gary said earlier, I think we need to do uh, more and can do more in the uh, sustainable energy trade agreement to address and reduce domestic content requirements. In, in my view, these domestic content requirements almost always distort trade and uh, are almost always purely protectionist. Usually, you find these types of requirements in government procurement arrangements or uh, in the provisions made for state-owned enterprises. These are two areas that I think increasingly have to be of general concern in the WTO, but certainly they would need to be addressed and could be addressed on a WTO plus basis in a sustainable energy trade agreement. Then there's the issue of subsidies. Fossil fuel subsidies are pernicious. The IEA tells us that they total about 500 billion worldwide on an annual basis. How in the world can we hope to reach a point where renewable energy can compete with fossil fuels on a price basis if we continue to subsidize fossil fuels to this extent? I certainly believe that this is an issue that can only be dealt with incrementally and by coalitions of the willing, 
but a sustainable energy trade agreement would give us a place to begin and a way to move forward on an incremental basis. The OECD tells us what's at stake here. They tell us that eliminating fossil fuel subsidies by 2020 would cut greenhouse gas emissions worldwide by 10% by 2050. That's worth doing. And then there are green subsidies. As we all know, uh, we're seeing an increasing proliferation of uh, trade disputes worldwide about green subsidies that are pr being provided by the United States, Canada, China, and other countries. In the absence of any action such as a sustainable energy trade agreement, we're going to see a more and more of these disputes. They're going to be increasingly contentious. I'm confident that my former colleagues in the appellate body at the WTO can reach the right judgments about these disputes under the existing rules, but I worry about the cumulative political consequences for the trading system if they're forced to do so. One of our recommendations in our report on trade and climate change for the WEF was that we take another look in the trading system at the potential for an exemption for green subsidies. As those of you who have followed these issues for a long time know, we used to have an exemption for green subsidies in the WTO agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures. It was approved in the Uruguay round for five years on a limited basis, not only for environmental uh, purposes, but uh, for regional development purposes. It was controversial at the time, which is why it was only approved for five years. The plan was to negotiate uh, an extension of uh, a redefined version of it in the year 2000. The aim was to find a way to uh, be able to support the environment through green subsidies consistently with WTO rules without unfairly and unduly distorting trade. This is a challenge for negotiators. It's a question of drawing the right line. But I would say again, better to draw that line through negotiations than to have jurists in the WTO dispute settlement system do it for you. Ironically, those negotiations failed because of the environmental protest in Seattle. The environmentalists themselves made certain that we would not extend an environmental exemption in the subsidies agreement by halting the proceedings in Seattle. My suggestion would be that we go back to the negotiating table on that issue and draw the right line that will enable us to create green subsidies that can be, in WTO terms, non-actionable subsidies under the WTO subsidies agreement. And this was one of our recommendations in our report. There's certainly no consensus for that now, but that's something that could be dealt with by coalitions of the willing in a sustainable energy trade agreement. There are other issues that we might address. I won't dwell on them all. Services, intellectual property, uh, the new area of export restrictions, which is more than worthy of an entire speech itself. Uh, a principal concern from the outset should be product coverage. This has uh, been at the heart of the continuing dispute over environmental goods and services in the Doha round. Uh, my view there is the same as that of uh, uh, Mr. Huffbauer, again, as usual. Uh, he recommends that we should uh, start with a short list uh, on which we all can agree. I agree with Gary on that. He recommends also that we include ethanol and biodiesel in, as a way of attracting the broadest participation, uh, especially from the BRIC countries. I agree with that. There's also the issue of the legal structure of this agreement. As I said, this can be done uh, pursuant to Annex 4 of the WTO agreement as a plurilateral agreement. But there are two ways we could go there. Uh, there are two uh, principal examples of plurilateral ag agreements that already exist under the WTO. One is the government procurement agreement. 
The other is the information technology agreement. We could take either as a model or perhaps find a way to uh, take an approach that combines some elements of both. Under the government procurement agreement approach, the concessions that are made would be available only to those who sign the agreement. Under the approach taken in the information technology agreement, once you reach a critical mass of coverage in terms of number of uh, signatories or uh, percentage of overall global product coverage, then the concessions that are made by those who sign the agreement are applied MFN uh, to all members of the WTO. I see this as an open question worthy of uh, discussion. Uh, my knee would jerk in favor of the approach taken under the government procurement agreement because I think it would be more politically doable in the shorter term. Some have suggested that we might choose to do a sustainable energy trade agreement outside the WTO. Of course, we could always uh, ask that it be uh, made a plurilateral agreement within the WTO later on. Uh, their reason for doing this, uh, for suggesting this, is that Russia in particular would then be able to participate, and Russia is not yet a member of the WTO. Well, I think Russia probably soon will be a member of the WTO. Uh, I'm like most former trade negotiators. I worry that uh, our diplomats may be in the process of sacrificing our commercial interests uh, for the sake of uh, certain perceived foreign policy interests in the negotiations with the Russians on WTO accession. But setting that aside, I think uh, there's a good chance that Russia will become a member of the WTO sooner rather than later. So I don't see that as a reason to do a sustainable energy trade agreement outside the auspices of the WTO. Uh, also, I think it's important that any agreement we have be not only fully binding but fully enforceable. And the best way to make certain of that is by making certain that it is enforceable in the WTO dispute settlement system. Otherwise, we'd have to invent a new dispute settlement system. In passing, I'll say this is one of the reasons why I don't understand why we're reinventing the trade wheel in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Because if we did it under the WTO, there too, we would have it fully enforceable under WTO dispute settlement. In conclusion, let me reiterate my very strong view that there is no need whatsoever to see that uh, the cause of combating climate change must in any way be inconsistent with the cause of lowering barriers to trade. In my view, quite the opposite is true. There are an abundance of opportunities for using existing WTO rules and for writing new WTO rules in ways that can be green in all kinds of ways. And I think that a sustainable energy trade agreement is one very important uh, way in which we could prove that. I'll be happy to try to answer any questions, time permitting. Thank you so much. Jim, thank you. That was terrific. Uh, we've got maybe 10 minutes of opportunity to tap this uh, uh, unparalleled uh, source of wisdom here. So the floor is open. Yes, Peter. Um, question on uh, the two disputes running right now. I'm referring to the, the U.S.-China one on subsidies and the, uh, the Japan-Canada on local content. Clearly, it would be very good, and that was my point when I was presenting, if these panels could be closed or concluded as soon as possible, giving guidance, giving guidance to markets on what is within the book and what is without the book. Um, you, you, you said um, that, um, or my question rather to you is, if there is a ruling on these two panels here, could that, could that give significant clearance taking up some of the, the pressure for setting, uh, setting a new uh, agreement like the Sustainable Energy 
a trade agreement. And give us an educated guess on how the cases will come out. Yeah. <laughs> well, sure. let me say first of all that as you, as you offer. I, I, I appreciate Fred's uh, comments about my unparalleled wisdom, but that probably depends uh, on whether one won or lost a case that one argued before me in Geneva. There are differing views of that in Washington and around the world. Um, and again, let me say that um, for all my confidence in WTO dispute settlement, I'm very much of the view that these sorts of issues should be resolved by negotiation and not through litigation. Will um, litigation be helpful by trying to uh, clarify, in the words of the WTO Treaty, the uh, existing obligations in the covered agreements? That's always the goal. The, the first goal is to resolve the dispute. That's always the goal. And the hope is that one can resolve the dispute by clarifying the obligations. That's what's at stake in the uh, case against uh, Canada involving the feed-in tariffs in Ontario and the local content requirements. That's what's at stake in the current case uh, against China in terms of its uh, renewable energy subsidies. Um, I don't know what the outcome of those cases will be. For the record, I'm not involved as a lawyer in either one of them. I would feel obliged to tell you if I was. I may be later, but right now I'm not. Um, I'm confident that the right judgments can be made. But there are certain issues that um, are problematic going forward. Uh, it's in, in subsidy cases, for example, there is always the question of uh, whether there is a subsidy or not. That's a definitional issue. Uh, my, economic, my friends who are economists uh, uh, don't like this, but something can be a subsidy economically and not be a subsidy legally. Uh, there is a legal definition of what is a subsidy in the WTO uh, subsidies agreement, and we're bound by that. In fact, we insisted on there being a definition, and this is the one we insisted on uh, a couple of decades ago. That is a threshold issue in these cases. Beyond that, the question will be usually what the effect of the subsidy is. There are certain kinds of subsidies that are illegal per se. They're prohibited subsidies. Uh, these are subsidies generally that are contingent on export performance or that are uh, conditioned on the use of uh, domestic over-imported products. In other words, ones that uh, are purely for uh, the purpose of promoting exports uh, and that won't exist uh, unless you export. They're tied to exports, as footnote four of the subsidies agreement says, and those that have a do domestic content uh, condition. These subsidies are illegal per se. They're automatically illegal if you can show they exist. For other subsidies, you've got to show that there is a financial contribution that provides a benefit uh, and that is specific to certain industries. These are all legal elements of proving that there is what is called an actionable subsidy. And then an actionable subsidy is illegal only if it has certain adverse effects in the marketplace. I go into all this because in these cases and in other cases we're likely to see, each of these issues will be addressed to one extent or another. The rulings in any individual dispute in dispute settlement uh, are rulings that relate only to that particular dispute. Under public international law, and WTO law is part of public international law, there is no law of precedent. There is no stare decisis. It's unlike the common law in the United States. However, the, the system itself exists, in the words of the treaty, to ensure security and predictability in the trading system. So members of the WTO are looking for consistency in the rulings. They want national treatment and most favored nation treatment to mean the same thing every day, everywhere, so that trade can move smoothly throughout the world. This is as it should be. So there's always two cases before uh, any jurist in the WTO, the case before it and all future cases. One of the challenges that we faced was always not prejudging future cases. 
Uh, another is trying to make certain that in resolving a particular disputes, you don't resolve other disputes in the wrong way. Uh, any stray sentence, any few words that is entered into an appellate body report will be quoted sometime later. Guarantee me. Uh, I'm dealing with a case now in which one sentence by the appellate body in one case 10 years ago has been used to justify by a small country called the United States of America their entire case. And this is their right. This is good lawyering. The appellate body will have to say whether they're right or not. So we will be looking at each of these cases at establishing rulings that although they are not strictly speaking precedents, will be relied on going forward by WTO members to assure security and predictability in the trading system. By and large, the dispute settlement system has been very good at doing that, and, very, and most members would say that the uh, panels and the appellate body have been very helpful overall in doing that and doing their job. But as I said earlier, there's a danger in my view that we're piling on far too many uh, disputes uh, into the dispute settlement system it's not that I don't have confidence that they can get the right results. I'm worried about the cumulative uh, consequence of uh, pushing too many political uh, impasses into legal uh, judgments that are binding on everyone going forward.